very good morning, afternoon, and evening to all of you. On behalf of the General Council for Islamic Banks and Financial Institutions, I have the honor and pleasure of welcoming all of you today to this webinar on Big Data Analytics in Islamic Finance, Catalyst for Growth and Transformation. Ladies and gentlemen, in the dynamic landscape of finance, the intersection of technology and Islamic principles is crucial for progress. Today, we delve into the profound impact of big data analytics on Islamic financial sector, a catalyst poised to stimulate growth and usher in a transformative era. As we navigate through the, this virtual gathering, we will uncover how leveraging big data can shape the future of Islamic finance, providing innovative solutions and strategic insights for industry players. Our distinguished panel of speakers representing diverse expertise in the field will share valuable insights into the potential of big data analytics. We will explore actionable strategies for implementing data-driven approaches, gain practical guidance on incorporating big data analytics in Islamic financial institutions, and network with the industry experts to expand our professional horizons. Ladies and gentlemen, before we start, we would like to make a couple of announcements. If you have any questions through the webinar, um, please do not hesitate to write them in the Q&A section that appears below, and we will try our best to answer these questions as much as we can. The webinar will be recorded and posted on Sibafi's social media platform in the coming days, so please follow us on social media for updates. We will also appreciate your kind feedback on the organization of the webinar by filling out the evaluation form for the webinar. Please note that after leaving the Zoom platform, you will be directed to the evaluation link. Now, without further ado, I have the pleasure to call upon Dr. Abdel Ilab Latiq, Secretary General of Sibafi, to deliver his welcoming remarks. Dr. Belatiq, the cloud is yours. Thank you, Rashid. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Wa salatu wa salam ala maulana rasulillah ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Distinguished guests, dear colleagues and friends, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Good morning, good afternoon or good evening to all of you wherever you are. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to see Bafi webinar uh, on big data analytics. Uh, I would like to start by thanking you for attending this uh, webinar with us and for uh, conveying my warm greetings and thanks to the panelists and the speakers that made time in the agenda for sharing with us their expertise and experience on the, the topic of uh, today's discussion. <clears throat> uh, well, I think the, the last 10 years, we have uh, probably seen an acceleration of innovations that is affecting the, the financial sector from the perhaps uh, uh, 1980s of uh, last century to uh, recent maybe 10 years. There, there was very slow progress of te technological advancements. Uh, with the start of the uh, expansion of the internet, we have seen perhaps uh, small steps towards uh, having uh, perhaps financial services delivered in 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 different ways and uh, using different means but we what we have seen uh, the, i mean the recent years is uh, the involvement of uh, new players uh, in the markets uh, like the big uh, big tech firms uh, and this because of a very important uh, uh, um, matters or new ways of looking of uh, the financial services and how we can approach uh, uh, customers. Uh, I think the advantage of the big tech firms is the availability of uh, big uh, data that they have, large amount of uh, information about uh, potential users of financial services or, or their, uh, their users. Uh, and the recent advancements in the technologies and algorithms that help in uh, cleaning and using uh, and extracting useful information from this data, combined with uh, more advanced and uh, uh, computer power. So the combination of these three factors perhaps have, have uh, uh, highlighted 
uh, the or increased or improved uh, how data is used and how perhaps approaching uh, customers can be, which has triggered perhaps these big tech firms to uh, start also looking at the financial services as a mean of expanding their their reach. And we see then, I mean, new business models uh, integrating the, the market, offering the financial services, new neobanks or other small uh, players starting some uh, of, of the services like uh, payment services, uh, transfers and, and so on. So yeah, I think against this backdrop, we, we think that it is important that for, for the banks also, and in particular the Islamic banks, to be integrating this uh, this wave and this move and to be uh, aware of what's happening and the potential that they have. So the, the banks and the Islamic banks have also large amounts of data and information. But uh, <clears throat> what we have seen and realized from the various surveys that we, we do with the, the Islamic banks and the discussions, that perhaps the potential of this data is not used uh, adequately or properly. So it is time to perhaps start looking at this uh, and see how perhaps uh, tools that exist, algorithms or AI or, or, or others that can help us in this in this process. Uh, so against this, uh, Sibafi has, of course, uh, for the last few years, has established an innovation and technology working group that has the, I mean, the mandates of sharing best practices in all innovations that may affect the financial services industry, and in particular, uh, Islamic banks. Uh, so uh, the work of, of the, the Innovation Technology Working Group has been um, to, uh, one, one of, I mean, the projects that we are working on is uh, looking at overall the, 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 the uh, digital transformations within financial services and Islamic banks, how they can be uh, implemented and the opportunities they can offer, looking at various uh, ways uh, technologies can affect the financial services and how Islamic banks, uh, they, have, they can use them. And it's a platform for sharing experiences and looking at uh, perhaps uh, some practices, some banks that are more advanced in, in particular areas. So we, we think that the combination of, uh, uh, I mean, the involvement of the financial services, the combination of uh, the availability of this data, which is, I think, one of the perhaps most important capital that uh, uh, banks have or uh, big tech firms uh, have, have the same and uh, the technological advancements combined with the computer power that is increasing uh, by the day will make uh, data more and more important and uh, should be very uh, critical for the Islamic banks to take leverage on this. And I think uh, it's an opportunity today to see some use cases and experiences how this can be implemented. This is part of a series of webinars that we will be having throughout the year, looking at various technologies and how they impact the financial services and the Islamic banking sector. So with this, I, I would like to thank again our, the, the, our speakers and experts that will be sharing their experience with us. Thank you very much and I look forward to hearing uh, from all of you and thanks to our participants. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Abdelila. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we will move to the panel session uh, where we will be discussing the transformative uh, power of, of data in today's digital age. And I will be honored to moderate this session. As we navigate through the, the profound impact of big data, its role in innovation, efficiency, and decision-making, we are honored to have our uh, three distinguished speakers with us today. Each of them brings a unique perspective on how big data is shaping the financial sector. Um, so as a presentation, we have, uh, or an introduction to the speakers, we have with us Mr. Hamid Mishan. He's the executive manager, head of retail banking at Kuwait Finance House in Bahrain. And we have also Ms. Faith Mosonza, strategy and digital financial inclusion experts at Acuma United Arab Emirates. And we have Dr. Maurice Schroff, is a principal at Strategy and uh, based in Frankfurt, uh, Germany. 
Without further ado, let's delve into the first segment of this discussion. So in the age of digitalization, data has become the new currency, reshaping industries and societies. So big data characterized by its volume, velocity, variety, and uh, ver uh, veracity is generated from um, diverse sources, propelling us into an era of unprecedented data um, abundance, uh, the exponential uh, growth of data driven by smartphones, IoT uh, devices, and technological advancements is expected to reach around 175 zettabytes by 2025. Um, in today's, um, or today, we're harnessing big data is um, a strategic uh, or, uh, imperative for businesses seeking a competitive age. Retailers personalize shopping experiences, healthcare accelerates drug discovery, and decision ma makers gain insights into customer behavior and market trends. Now, let's hear from our speakers on the specific impact of big data in the uh, financial sector. And I would like to direct my first question to Ms. Faith. Um, Ms. Faith, in your experience, how has the utilization of big data and data analytics specifically uh, contributed to the efficiency and decision-making process within the financial sector? Over to you, Ms. Faith. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rashid. It's an honor to be here. And uh, in response to the question that you've raised, we see that when we look at uh, the banking and financial sector in 2010, and we look at the banking and financial sector today, there is a huge transformational uh, difference. And uh, this is testament to the transformation that has been taking place and is also still taking place as well. And uh, what we also see is that the adoption of these new cutting edge technologies, um, they are very relevant to the financial sector. And um, one of the questions um, as has been raised and one of the concerns is that um, while the big data and big analytics is transforming the world of finance, is it relevant to Islamic finance? Definitely, it is not an exception. And it is also true that it is relevant to them as well. And one of the concerns that has been raised is that while we generate so much data, it's, it's somehow unclear how you know uh, people can exploit this highly valuable resource and how they can leverage and further develop um, based on the data that has been that has been captured. I want to bring to your attention. Uh, the fact that in um, today's world, uh, according to GSMA, um, they highlighted that we have over 1.4 billion adults around the world who still remain unbanked. And this information, um, it has been collected through different data sources. And what it simply means is that we still have a huge number of people who are not being serviced by financial institutions neither are they uh, within the mobile ena enabled uh, financial services brackets as well. And also interesting to note that is that big data analytics is big business, which is estimated to represent around over 300 billion by 2023. And there is definitely a huge opportunity for the financial services and banking sector to progressively embrace the benefits of big data analytics um, on a corporate level, individually, and on a national level as well. And what these uh, insights, what, what uh, big data and uh, data analytics, what it does for that for us is that it enables better decision making. It opens up, you know, opportunities for innovation, how we manage risk and compliance, how we can also improve um, operational um, efficiencies, and also how we can also improve our own services uh, to the customers. And um, I'd like to note that uh, if we go back to the period of COVID, 
uh, while we had a huge number which was not within the financial services bracket, we see that it was somewhat difficult for people to have face-to-face -face interaction. And this became a great opportunity to actually onboard quite a number of people who then began the adoption of actually using um, digital payments, for example, using their mobile phones. Uh, we also saw uh, there's also a huge influx in terms of cross-border payments, which were also taking place during that period in time. And we see the scale is also uh, continually being magnified even up to this very day. So what big data analytics has done and is also doing for us and the benefits that um, leadership can also leverage on is, for example, it helps you to understand um, customer experiences. It helps you to understand the different patterns and behaviors of your customers, for example. And based on that information, it helps us to actually develop better new cutting edge um, features which are relevant. Uh, we are able to develop much more convenient products and services that are relevant to the market. And we are also able to identify gaps in terms of mitigating uh, risks that arise when we're looking at issues of um, security and compliance as well. And we are also able to develop better products that can help us to actually combat uh, fraud and make actually better, better investment decisions. And what this data also does as well, um, what, what, it, what it has done for the industry is that it has helped us to create technologies which are relevant for us today, which are scalable. So we're no longer only just looking at uh, a scenario whereby we, we have the brick and mortar, but we are seeing a transition to the cloud and also uh, new innovations being taken um, into consideration as well. And we see new partnerships which are being built up for us to be able to scale, to strengthen the products and also to reach out to new markets as well. And uh, we have seen uh, quite a number of uh, organizations. They are not only just localized, but now they have become localized. You are local, but with global presence. And I want to believe that it is because of this new innovations and technologies and reach and access, which have been enabled and through uh, the data which is being collated, it is enabling decision makers to be able to make new decisions in terms of considering how can we be able to grow our business? Which business models can we adopt? How can we bring in more money? Where do we need to cut down costs? What we are providing to the market, is it still very relevant for us today or do we need to take into consideration new changes and also remain relevant? And um, one of the things that has also been noted as well is while big data causes great, um, great security risks, and dangers because there's so much information which is coming in and being processed at the same time. The other question that is being raised is how reliable and relevant is this information? So when information is gathered, we are now able to process that data. We are able to categorize our data and we're able to, to utilize it and turn it in such a way that it can be relevant to our needs. Data within the financial services sector uh, may not necessarily be the same information which is relevant within the healthcare sector. But however, what I love is that embedded finance, it cuts across all the industries. And we are collecting so much data from the healthcare sector, from the education sector, because people are processing payments. And um, with all that information, it helps us to understand the different sectors. We, we are able to understand and also develop uh, better products which are relevant and answers to each industry specific needs. And um, today we also see that uh, we, we, with the a large amount of volumes of data which is coming in, uh, regulators are also becoming concerned. So it is no longer just me walking into a shop and I'm just processing payment, there are different layers of regulation and compliance which are embedded within just 
that one act of me walking into a shop, taking my card and that's taping it uh, onto the machine to process my payment. And with all that information, how then do we grow our economies? Are we providing products, services that are relevant? And how then can, um, uh, can decision makers be able to leverage on this information and provide solutions that are relevant, that are scalable, that are also, um, that can be replicated over and over again. And one of the other questions that we do have is the issue of interoperability. Uh, the technologies that we have today, how easy is it for us to be able to integrate the different systems, the different technologies, how then uh, can, can, can the different systems be able to talk to each other within the financial services sector? And uh, you're also looking at, it's not only just the technology, but we're also talking about integration when it comes to the skill sets that are going to help to support the infrastructure, to help to support in terms of the operations delivery, and also looking at um, the legal perspective as well. We need to ensure that uh, decision makers are quite cognizant of how this different um, segments and uh, features are able to speak to one another and we can also be able to get to a point where we can also uh, multiply and increase. And the other good thing is that it is not only, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, big data analytics does not only allow us to be localized, but it allows us to, 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 to go global, which means cutting across different jurisdictions. It means cutting across different um, legal um, legal requirements and having to come to a point where we can be able to allow our systems to be able within their unique features to be able to speak with one another. For example, in Bahrain, your services are not just within Bahrain, you've got customers who are based within the USA, customers who are within, within Africa, how then can they be able to contribute to your ecosystem as well? So having to be able to build those infrastructures that are interoperable and um, that can, can, can be able to transcend the different borders as well is something which um, decision makers can be able to, to leverage on. Thank you, Ms. Faith. Um, I think you have um, uh, mentioned a number of uh, benefits or um, let's say um, positive impact of what big data can, can bring to the financial sector. You've also highlighted some of the challenges, but I think we can, we can look at that in details um, uh, later. But I will, I will pick one idea from, from uh, uh, from the points you have you have mentioned, and it is related to the role or the relationship between um, banks, financial inclusion, and how can big data um, enhance the role of of banks in in serving unbanked uh, segments or or population, and we will really need to understand big data for for banks, and we are lucky to have with us. Uh, Mr. Hamid, who's uh, uh, someone we deeply involved in the banking sector. So my 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 next question is to you, Mr. Uh, Hamid. How do you define or interpret the the term big data within the context of of a bank? What are the 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 practical implications for a bank aiming to um, harness big data effectively? The cloud is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Rashid. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, when we talk, when we look at big data from the perspective of a retail bank, we first need to take a step back and, and identify who this retail bank is serving. And if we look at it in, in, in the essence, the retail bank serves a mass market. So we're not, ser uh, we're not serving a certain, in, uh, certain individual, we are serving all individuals. And understanding uh, one person uh, may be complicated, but understanding the mass market is incredibly challenging. And how do you understand your customers so that you can serve them better? So we noticed that retail banks have over the past few decades have moved uh, into a very uh, more customer centric business model, placing the customer at the center of all of their activities and all of their innovation. 
uh, because at the end of the day, that is your, your lifeline. That is what you're there to serve. And big data helps in this a lot. Um, one of the main things, maybe, maybe the most overarching thing that big data helps in retail bank is understanding customers and enhancing the customer insights. So big data analytics effectively allows us to gather and analyze, analyze a vast amount of customer data from many different sources, like transaction records, online interactions, even extending into social media, demographic information, and leveraging on this data, banks can, get, can gain much deeper insights into customer behavior, preferences, and needs. That helps then the banks personalize their offerings uh, making sure that they're able to create targeted marketing campaigns that directly serve the needs of their segmented market and provide tailored financial solutions as well. Not just generic products that would apply uh, on, on, on to everybody, but to provide uh, the ability to have uh, certain segments within that product that that's meet the certain niche requirements of the masks. And at the end of it, ultimately improving the customer satisfaction and the loyalty towards the bank. So that's what big data can help uh, banks understand if they're analyzed in the correct way. But it's not just about customers for retail bank. Uh, well, as I said, that's maybe the most important part, but there are many equally, maybe or le less equally vi uh, vital um, aspects that big data can help. Uh, among the very important ones and maybe equally to towards customer satisfaction is risk management and fraud detection. Uh, big data analytics can really help retail banks when, when identified correctly. They can identify and mitigate the risks more effectively of, of potential frauds and, and uh, risk analysis with regards to the you know, patterns, anomalies, and potential fraud attempts as well. And this really helps banks uh, take proactive measures rather than reactive measures to prevent uh, fraudulent activities, protect customer accounts, and ensure the security of transactions all in all to give much, much more confidence to customers that the bank itself is significantly protected and is protecting the customer's financial positions. Uh, that's one element that big data can really help banks in. The other element as well is, and that goes in line with providing customers with, with uh, better quality service, is your own internal operational efficiency. Using big data within your own organization can really optimize various operational processes. So for example, if you analyze data relating to branch performance or staff productivity or customer queues or transaction volumes, you can really identify the bottlenecks that you have in your internal operational process. And then you can streamline those, those procedures and allocate the resources more efficiently across the whole process chain. This can also, not, not only will this result in an improved service for your customers, but it's also going to help you decrease costs which means you're able to even offer better pricing for your customers and effectively compete in a much better way in an already competitive market. Uh, another aspect is linking into customer insights is your product and develop development and innovation. So the way that you develop products and the way that you come up with new services and the different financing structures, having the customer insights, having big data, allows you to really understand customer behaviors and preferences ahead of the market and to be able to provide products and uh, through forecasting measures of what you believe customers will require over the coming period rather than working reactively and addressing an existing need. And that really helps bank uh, remain competitive, increase them and increase their market share. Uh, another another very important aspect is your compliance and regulatory requirements. Now, as we know, the banking sector is heavily regulated and rightfully so. Uh, because the banks operate in a highly regulated environment, big data analy analytics can really help banks and manage the compliance with these regulatory requirements, such as your AML and KYC regulations. If you analyze large volumes of data within your banking uh, database, you can identify, as we mentioned earlier, fraud detection, suspicious activities, and you can also monitor transactions for regulatory compliance and help generate reports that you need for your own regulatory reporting. All in all, all of these matters uh, using uh, the big data framework helps banks analyze uh, data better and make strategic decisions much better proactively rather than reactively. So when you analyze historical data and real-time information, you can gain valuable access into market trends, customer behavior, and your own business performance. 
And this really helps you then in formulating effective strategies, optimizing your pricing models, identifying potential new segments that you want to go into, and really making informed decisions about the investments and the expansions that you need as a bank to be able to compete in this environment. So all in all, in summary, uh, big data really has significant implications, significant usefulness for a retail bank. It really empowers banks uh, to improve on their customer experiences, manage the risk uh, when it comes to financial transactions, enhance their own efficiency, it drives innovation, and helps uh, make better informed decisions overall. Thank you, Mr. Hamid. So now we know how uh, big data can help um, banks in the various operations and um, various activities of, of the of a retail bank. But the question is, how can we um, um, elaborate a strategy that can help us achieve these um, these um, these objectives? And this question will be uh, is addressed to uh, Dr. Morris. If you can please highlight the strategic importance of big data for the growth. Um, and development of the financial sector and provide like specific strategies or approaches that financial institutions can adopt to uh, maximize the impact of big data on their um, growth uh, trajectory. Uh, over to you, Dr. Morris. Sure, thank you very much. Uh, and also thanks for, for, for having me, so to say. I think um, essentially like, you know, picking up on, on what people previously said, we don't need to go through all the aspects, but it's quite clear that, um, you know, particularly big data and also the phenomena which are associated with it have a, a large impact on the financial sector. Yeah, I think we all agree on that. And also uh, in, in terms of offer, offering unique opportunities and challenges. Um, in, in the moment and with the, you know, mountains and mountains of additional data, which are, so to say, generated continuously and the deeper and deeper insights which, which come along, there's obviously also a pronounced impact on, um, on financial services. And, uh, and that's more important at this stage here, really on the Islamic finance domain. Yeah. So um, we, we picked out and this partially, you know, overlaps a bit um, with, uh, with, with obviously what uh, previous commentators already mentioned, uh, different areas in which we really believe there is, so to say, a way to facilitate growth within the industry. And based on that, also then um, a, a trajectory for, for further development. And, and it's essentially, I, I would like to go into um, seven of these, which are uh, particularly the risk and regulatory realm, the customer segmentation, compliance, innovation, so product innovation, particularly customer experience, uh, ethics and, and operational efficiency, yeah? And, and maybe just let me go through them very briefly um, and, and maybe um, also in, in, in that regard, uh, try to outline what we think, how data can help particularly um, in, in the Islamic uh, finance realm, yeah? So obviously, in, let us start with the risk management. Every, we, we all know, yeah, that there are specific, you know, risk trajectories within Islamic finance. For instance, if you want to issue something like a, and, and please excuse if, if the pronunciation is not entirely correct, but something like a sukuk, right, a Islamic-based bond, yeah, uh, you, you could use big data to analyze the structures, ensuring that you avoid the riba and, uh, so, this, to, so to say, the interest, right, and, 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 and also analyze the underlying assets of the service. Um, you, you, can, you can also check volatility parameters more easy in terms of avoiding gara, right, and, and based on that, you will have, like, enhanced insights on your overall well exposure in terms of the in terms of the risk book of the bank no and um it it, it will facilitate so to say decision making second second example would be in terms of the uh, market expansion and also customer segmentation and um, i mean it's it's quite clear that a central um uh, a central uh, principle within islamic finance is the Muraba, right? Like the profit and risk sharing. And um, based on that, 
um, additional data sources will uh, provide you with ideas on how to explore niche markets, right? Um, for instance, identifying regions where Sharia compliant financial products are in demand, yeah? And, and based on that, also establishing um, principles of fair and, and respective trade with these, with these, new, with these new markets. Um, what has already been mentioned is, is the third point is uh, compliance and fraud detection. Still, I would like to comment on that very briefly because I feel that uh, particularly uh, in terms of the uh, opportunities of generative AI yeah, and, and artificial intelligence in a more broader realm and the, the, the option now with large language models based on something like account monitoring principles. And we've done that at, at a, a large uh, development bank uh, in, in the region, in the Middle Eastern region from the strategy end side, right? Uh, that you have uh, a scanning for non, uh, or a scanning for haram activities, so to say, yeah? And um, also to check that uh, um, you have the Muaraba principles enforced and so on and so forth. In, in, so, so you can actually have like a very, very large scale um, can have a very, very large uh, compliance, anti-money laundry, uh, counter-terrorism financing operation, so to say, um, in, in terms of compliance and fraud detection, um, just enhanced by, by the data sets and the transaction monitoring and obviously the algorithms running on it. Um, so that's definitely an enhancement. Um, so uh, maybe let me comment on the on the other points very briefly in terms of uh, the innovation of, of of new financial products. Uh, we also think that data can help here, right? right? Because in in terms of the development of Sharia compliant microfinance products, for instance, yeah, um, and and we all know that the the, the concept the concept of uh, quarter sun, so to, so to say, like the benevolent loan, yeah, in terms of microfinance, is something which the uh, Islamic finance world. Uh, you know, aspires to to provide to different communities, and uh, that that will also be you know facilitated uh, by by uh, large um, scale data accumulation and also analysis more more or less. Yeah, and that that you can enhance customer experience, which is the fifth point, is I think quite clear. Uh, but but then also um, you can think about something like you know chatbots. You can think about using. Um, large language models. Um, many German banks do it in the moment, for instance, in order to, you know, have like super highly customized um, um, interaction with their clients, right? Also, in terms of the context length, context length means in that regard the, 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 the so to say, the, the memory of the large language model like ChatGPT or Google's Bard or whatever, right? So that it really remembers what you mentioned to him the last time and so on and so forth. And finally, I think one of the aspects we really need to highlight is also the social and ethical investing aspect because it's so important in, within Islamic finance, right? If you think about the concept um, of uh, Khalifa, uh, like environmental stewardship and, so, and, uh, and, 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 and social fairness and so on, um, I think uh, that's also something where you can not only use uh, big data analytics to um, evaluate really the impact of some investment, for instance, in the portfolio, right? Uh, because you, you understand better what they do, for instance, by their published numbers or also by the numbers which they have to provide you with in terms of portfolio reporting, but also to screen the media outside, right? Like, I mean, for a German bank, what we did is, for instance, they really wanted to have an understanding about the ESG perception. You know, in Europe, there's obviously, as, as is in the Middle East, a huge discussion about ESG and how uh, you can, so to say, prove also to the regulator that you are ESG compliant. And, and based, in, based on that, uh, that's, a, that's a huge, not only the, the, the hard numbers, but also the the, the perception, for instance, in the social media, this is something which we call social media listening, yeah, and how this is perceived by the, the masses or also people like tweeting about it and so on and so forth is, I think, really crucial. So let me close with, with like three things, I believe, which are really the core aspects of growth and development for Islamic finance, finance based on the, on the, you know, like... Uh, big data analytics and also, you know, like more broader technological topics, it's really that you are able to make enhanced decisions. Yeah. Decision making is more real time and it's more facilit it's more data driven. And then um, it, it provides you potentials for market expansion and uh, obviously also uh, uh, the compliance monitoring. Yeah. Will, will definitely be, become easy and you will understand in a more, um, neat way how your decisions as an entrepreneur or so to say as a bank for instance really or financial services player uh, impacts also uh, the perception of the people 
who uh, buy from you, like your clients, for instance. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Norris. So building on your insights, so let's say a bank wants to uh, look at these benefits and leverage all the benefits of big data. Is there like a specific framework that would uh, prioritize uh, some key components uh, that uh, to, to establish a data-driven uh, business strategy to maintain the, the, the competitiveness of, of the bank in the market, knowing that now we have not only the, the traditional conventional financial institutions in the market, but we have um, a new entrants that are um, very um, um, skilled when it comes to using technology, analyzing data. So is there like uh, specific components that a bank should look at in order to, to develop um, a driven uh, strategy um, that is data-driven? Exactly. So, and this is, I mean, this is a very good point, right? Because particularly in the banking space, and and uh, I, I invite everybody to challenge this because it's a, it's a, so to say, it's a subjective um, opinion, yeah, um, or like so to say. I mean, opinions are always subjective, but 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 I um, but but I think that particularly in the banking realm, there are many, you know, like if you talk to relationship managers and also like credit decision makers, for instance, many of them have like their, their gut feeling. And we've been with the advent of big data, we've been starting and starting to, uh, you know, get more and more data driven in the financial services landscape. Yeah, there's obviously a huge cultural aspect to that. But I can talk about this in, in a minute very briefly. Yeah, but, but in general, what I believe, what you really need to have um, are like the three main points, yeah? And then there are a couple of um, uh, supplementary uh, pillars, so to say, to that, yeah? But the three main points are really um, in order to establish, you know, a data-driven business strategy, um, you need to start to have a, like a, a robust data infrastructure. So what does it mean, right? You need to have like a, an IT stack, which is actually capable of providing these real-time insights, yeah? Um, if, for instance, the infra infrastructure needs to support like more complex, um, you know, um, also Islamic finance products like the, the, the Mudaraba, right? Or the Mushakara, the joint venture and, and so on and so forth. Yeah. But it also needs to be able to get in enough data sources and eventually also to have a, a, the, the capability to either run something like a generative AI model on its own, which is most of the time not the case, or to at least have a cloud infrastructure um, or like at least a negotiation contracts with, with cloud providers established to have a, a sandbox on which to run these applications because by, by, by long or far, uh, we, we are not going or also, Islamic finance is not going to be able to scale in a technological way without the, uh, tapping the potential of, of artificial intelligence or generative artificial intelligence. Yeah, this is this is really the infrastructure component, and cloud is a, really something which is very very important. Also, to reduce the fixed cost, but but this is an, even another consideration. Second of the three points is um, the capabilities. Yeah, so we talk about the infrastructure. Infrastructure in itself is kind of useless if you do not have the people who really can contribute and who have the knowledge. Yeah, so now we are at a, a crossroads, so to say, because the artificial intelligence and general artificial intelligence bring us to a point where this knowledge and these technologies are more and more democratized, right? Uh, now, in order to write an, uh, a PowerPoint slide or uh, write code, so to say, you most of the time you actually do not need to be able to code yourself, but you can just like ask uh, an AI tool to write code which does X, Y, Z. So that means um, you still, but you still need like in a hub and spoke model, yeah? Some people who are uh, really, you know, firm within these methodologies and some people who can, so to say, in the own, in the different departments of the bank, like in risk and in the corporate bank and the retail bank and so on and so forth, can actually like check that the data literacy is up to a level which allows people to leverage these tools in a uniform manner. The third thing, which is really important, is so we talked about infrastructure, we talked about capabilities. The third thing is really 
the data governance and the data governance in this in the form of uh, of, uh, of Islamic finance is obviously needs to be Sharia compliant. Yeah, but the the, the main thing here is uh, you have infrastructure capabilities. You need the roles and responsibilities now. So how do data flow through the organization and who is responsible for what? Who has the single source of truth? So data governance is a cutting edge topic. We just did a project last year with a an, an asset manager in Germany who uh, had huge problems had establishing their enterprise data model. They really, really needed to focus on the data governance, their data quality as well. This is obviously a component. You, you need to make sure that you have your data quality right from the beginning, right from the single source way where, where the data comes into the organization. Yeah. Um, and um, based on that, obviously, uh, in, in that regard, also in the, in the data governance realm, it's, it's quite important to to, to, to look at that and to um, establish it in a robust way, also with senior management backing. Yeah? Without uh, dragging this uh, you know, too long, maybe let me very briefly go over a couple of more aspects which I think are uh, relevant, which is obviously uh, you know, ethical data use and privacy, particularly uh, in terms of Islamic finance, yeah? and integrating also uh, Islamic ethical standards and also decision-making processes. This is something you know, which which often needs to be done on a case by case by uh, basis, and obviously also something like uh, you know compliance audits in order to make sure that data are used only in the intended form and a, a customer centric approach. Because only if it's customer centric, you actually get the feedback from uh, so to say the 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 the, the, the clients. Yeah, um, most of the time in organizations, it's quite often the case that people have or that. The business asks IT, if we do it more data driven, how much does it cost? But nobody sees the benefits, right? It's only a cost case. Oh, it, it costs lots of money for the infrastructure and so on and so forth. But if you do it client centric, you actually attract people and that enhances your revenues, not only in retail, but also in corporate banking. And this is something which always needs to be kept in the loop because otherwise, you know, and sometimes it's a, it's a, a now some game, so to say. Um, but these, at least from my perspective, would be the main pillars on which you need to center around in order to establish a data-driven, um, you know, business model with, within the uh, within the bank, considering Islamic finance. Thank you, Dr. Maurice. And I will go back to uh, Mr. Hamid. So, reflecting on your uh, um, bank's journey in adopting a data-driven strategy or a strategy that is based on on big data, could you share? Any notable achievements that have resulted from leveraging big data? Additionally, where did, if there is any specific challenges faced during the, this process, and how uh, your bank uh, um, put like actionable um, uh, processes to overcome uh, these uh, challenges? Over to you, Mr. Ham. Thank you, Rashid. Um, basically, so in, in terms of what we've done at Kuwait Finance House in Bahrain is we, we've identified the, the need to understand our customers quite early on. And so based on that, we started developing the database, uh, which will contain the data from, uh, you know, from, from, from our customers, basically. Uh, and uh, we're this is a never ending journey. We're still looking at the different ways to analyze data and understand our customers. So this has already started. It's already part of the process. It's uh, embedded within retail banking that all of our decisions, I mean, uh, uh, I think uh, Dr. Maurice just mentioned something about, you know, uh, uh, as an opinion, uh, bankers have a gut feeling. Uh, the beauty of big data now is that if you end up having a gut feeling as a banker with respect to a certain product, client, or even just a single financing, uh, financing exposure, uh, you you can substantiate that gut feeling whether it's true or false or whether you believe there's a good confidence level that this is a true gut feeling through the analysis the analysis of this big data, uh, and so uh, no longer do you have to uh, rely on uh, simple analysis, but now you can have with the use of generative AI you can have a lot of a lot more information uh, that can support uh, how you make decisions uh, as a banker. But this does not come without uh, certain challenges. And I think the doctor already mentioned a couple of them, so I, I won't repeat them, but I'll just talk about how they specifically impact a retail bank. Uh, data quality, uh, I think the doctor mentioned that, it's, it's a very big challenge that we have. Uh, ensuring that the, the data that we have is of uh, good quality 
uh, specific, specifically when you need to integrate data from various resources, it is quite a challenge because data ends up being sometimes fragmented, it's inconsistent, or just generally has a poor quality. And that can really affect the accuracy and reliability of the analysis coming out of that data. So we have to always be very careful when we're, when we're looking at the outcome, the output that we have of this analysis, we need to make sure that the data that went into this analysis is organized in the right way, is of a very good quality, and is relevant to the, to the nature of the anal analytics work that needs to be done. Otherwise, you might end up with an, a, a result that uh, you venture on and turns out to be incorrect because of something wrong with the data. So as a bank, we need to make sure that the data governance framework we have, the cleansing processes that we have for data, and the integration strategies are very clear to be able to overcome these challenges. And that's what we started working on as a bank right now, to try and, and, and create a much better quality of data so that can, the, the next steps can follow. Uh, in addition to that, an, another very, another very uh, important challenge that we have is when it comes to data security and privacy. And that clubs in together with the regulatory and legal considerations as well as ethical considerations. So we need to really uh, understand that with the increased use of big data, we need to address concerns relating to data security and privacy. How we handle sensitive customer information and, uh, and, and making sure that no data breaches uh, are there is very crucial in this whole process. So we, we always try to implement uh, very robust security measures. Uh, we try to comply with all the data privacy regulations and more, and also go one level higher and ensure that there's an ethical use of the customer data. Uh, you can only use customer data to the extent that it benefits the customer with the customer's consent, obviously, uh, that can be revoked at any time. So all of these measures need to be really managed in a very, in a very uh, efficient way uh, so that the sanctity of this data which belongs to the customer at the end of the day is protected uh, and that not 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 also in addition to all this also we have to make sure that we are in compliance with all the data protection laws uh, we make sure that there's transparency in the data collection and usage and address any other potential legal concerns there as well so this is a, there's a lot of challenges in addressing and analyzing this data that we try to always uh, keep in mind whenever we're doing anything relating to data analytics. Uh, but one of the other technical concerns that we have as well is the scalability and infrastructure. And I think Doctor touched on that a bit as well, is the infrastructure's uh, ability to handle this large volumes of data and really perform complex analytical tasks. There's significant amount of investment that needs to go into this. Uh, there is a return on that investment, obviously. Uh, when that return and how quantifiable that return is, is the challenge on the business side to uh, place in, in order to get, uh, basically have the budgets uh, uh, allocated for the significant investment in terms of storage capacity, computational power, and uh, even adopting uh, new, new age solutions like cloud-based solutions uh, and investing in other advanced technologies. But the final thing that I want to also mention here is one of the biggest challenges that we are facing and that we might face in the future if we don't respond to that now is the talent and skills gap that exists within data anal analysts, data scientists, and professionals with exper expertise in big data technologies. There is sort of a shortage in that field, and uh, this is an opportunity for banks. Uh, it, it makes it challenging for us right now, but it's an opportunity for banks to start investing in training and development programs to bridge that skills gap and really attract top talent. Uh, in the future, I, I foresee that data analytics will become a much more important core function of any retail bank and will sit alongside the strategy departments uh, because I think they go hand in hand together. And uh, I mean, in conclusion, while we've achieved significant milestones in leveraging big data to today, we still continue to face challenges with regarding to data quality, security, talent, and talent acquisition. And uh, the next few years are, are key in trying to overcome these challenges. And the way that we can do that is by adopting a strategic approach towards big data and data analytics, uh, which then will trickle down into investments in technology and talent, keeping a commitment within the entire organization to maintain the highest ethical standards in data analytics practices. Thank you, Mr. Hamid. Um, and to continue with the with the challenges, uh, I would like to ask uh, Ms. Faith to 
elaborate more on uh, the specific challenges faced by any financial uh, institutions when it comes to adopting um, uh, data analytics and also additionally to, to share uh, specific insights uh, into effective solutions to overcome these challenges and ensure a smooth uh, adoption uh, process. Ms. Fate, over to you. Yes, um, I believe my colleagues have also highlighted uh, some of the challenges that we have been facing in terms of from a strategic point of view and also within the banking sector. They are also synonymous as well within the financial services sector, issues of uh, data privacy and security. And uh, over the last um, past uh, couple of uh, months, uh, we, we've also witnessed in last year as well, we've also witnessed quite a number of uh, fraudulent activities uh, that have been taking place. I myself, I'll give an example of my, uh, I'll share my own story where uh, one day I was traveling and then I see messages that are flying on my mobile phone of transactions, but I didn't think about it at that point in time. And then when I just got on home, I, I looked into my account and then I realized that money had been taken out of my, my bank account. And uh, this is the reality which is taking place. And uh, these are the challenges that we are facing in terms of how then do we make um, you know, the systems that we have much more secure. And I believe that uh, big data analytics um, has come at a right time where it's able to flag out some of these gaps that are available and we're able to mitigate some of the risks uh, that have been highlighted. And when we look at this challenge in terms of how do we secure uh, people's data and how do we secure uh, you know, the, the, the people's wealth that we are holding and the transactions uh, that are also being processed within the ecosystem as well. It is very important for organizations to understand that even though today there are so many solutions which are being provided, ensure that is it the right technology that you're going to adopt as an organization? What are the um, ethical, uh, you need to do an ethical background, uh, the due dil you, you, you have to do your due, dil due diligence and understand uh, what are the security features and parameters are available within the system? Are they applicable to us? And uh, will it work well for us to be able to serve our, our customers effectively and for us to remain compliant as well within uh, within the industry as well, uh, because there's so much information which is quite sensitive, which is being shared from one system to another. And it's very important for us to be able to ensure that um, we, 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 we protect that uh, sensitive information. And uh, while we're at it as well, in terms of finding the right technology, uh, it's also important to um, also explore and understand is this technology um, will it seamlessly integrate with existing um, infrastructure that we do have? And one of the questions that people always bring up is, do we have the finances for us to be able to, um, to implement a new technology system? So it's very important to say when we are considering what sort of technology stake are we going to integrate? Is it also scalable? And... Um, uh, is it also going to uh, be cost effective as well? Because what ends up happening is, for example, within uh, the financial services sector, you realize that um, if a new product is introduced, if we do not take into consideration the cost element, half the time that cost is going to be pushed over to the customer. And we are at a time where we need to find solutions that are cost effective, not only to the organization in terms of deployment, but also cost effective for customers, for them to be able to adopt and also uh, enjoy the benefits of using the services and the products that we have to actually offer. So the technology is very important. And um, I believe one of the other challenges as well that we, 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 we've, we've been uh, currently battling in uh, with when, we come, when, we, when it comes to the issue of um, cross-border um, communication in the financial uh, sector is the regulations. We've got new technologies that are coming up every now and again, and uh, the speed of adoption in terms of policies 
how quick are we to incorporate and understand the new technologies which is being developed and how quick are we to ensure that we put in place the right policies to ensure that uh, there's going to be ethical use of, uh, of these new technologies and uh, also in terms of the information that is being derived. And um, I believe my, my colleagues have also highlighted the issue of, um, of privacy and, uh, and, and security as well. And one of the things that, um, one of the features that we have done is it's important to ensure that our teams are well equipped. I cannot stress this uh, overly enough. We may uh, go, you know, off the roof talking about how much we need to adopt a new technology, but without the right skills, the right talent, without people fully understanding and appreciating this new technology, it is redundant. It is useless to us. So it is very important that we start training and equipping our people with the right skills with the right knowledge that they need for them to be able to use the, uh, the, the new technology and for us to be able to scale up the technology. But it doesn't end uh, in, in terms of uh, the professionals within our ecosystem, but we also have to um, have uh, training programs where we also, um, we, we, we also bring up that awareness uh, when, it, when we are going to launch a new products to the customers. And I know for a fact when we were doing some um, some some new product launch uh, within Africa for some uh, agricultural technology, uh, which was embedded into the mobile um, mobile uh, network phone. So what was happening was farmers did not trust the financial services, and what they didn't understand was the technology that was being offered to them was going to help them to actually scale up. Uh, their productivity, it was going to help them to understand the different markets, the different seasons, and for them to be able to understand if we're going to be changing the different seasons, what do I need to do as a farmer? How then do I access uh, new financial um, instruments for, for, for me to be able to, um, to capitalize my business as well. So this new ecosystem that was created uh, and also through the awareness programs that we did run, people were able to understand the financial services and the banking sector is not cut out to take money away from them, but we're here to support them and to ensure that their businesses grow. Because ultimately why we are here is to ensure that we drive economic growth and success not only on a national level, but also when we're coming back down to the individual as well. And once we have a robust uh, ecosystem that is functional, we'll see that it is much, it's quite easier for us to be able to, to, to develop further uh, new products and services that are relevant to the needs of the different categories that we do cater for within the ecosystem. And um, what we also then further went on to do was we also did create a uh, new, 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 new standard, uh, sorry, standard operating procedures uh, from a delivery point of view. And also we had quite a number of content and uh, awareness um, material which was delivered and also easily accessible to the customers and also to us, uh, the service providers as well. So it is very important to invest in training programs to existing staff and recruit people with the right skills. And then there's also that knowledge transfer that has to be done. And, uh, and sometimes maybe as an organization, you do not have the right skills. It is okay to outsource uh, the, the, the skills that are required for you to be able to, to, to scale up and also remain competitive and also relevant uh, within, within a competitive, ever-changing market landscape. And uh, what was also mentioned as well was when we're looking at the technology, where do we house uh, or host our information, especially when we're local? Uh, it's important for us to also consider cloud-based solutions that can be scalable and uh, that can also um, incorporate or accommodate 
ease of upgrading the infrastructure that we have and also providing you know guidelines in terms of how that data is going to be used how it can be accessed and also transparency as well. I, I believe uh, as the banking and financial services sector with all the information that we have, uh, customers, what they're looking from us is the assurance of, are we going to provide them security? Are we going to provide a layer of trust? And are we also going to provide a layer of ease of access for them? So I believe in understanding what the market needs, we're able to provide also the right technology and the relevant products and services that will be required. And also reliability of our, of our technologies as well. I think it's something that, um, that would help us to grow and also expand even further. And as, as, as an industry, we need, um, I believe sometimes there's not much information which is available out there. So it is high time that, you know, we, we joined hands together and ensure that we start providing relevant information. It doesn't mean that we're going to be releasing information on a customer's profile, but there's need for us to be able to understand what are the statistics available that, you know, companies can leverage on for them to be able to make informed decisions, not only from um, a company, a corporate perspective, but as an industry and also comparing ourselves on a global landscape as well. So the ease and reliability of that information would also help us to be able to, to grow. Thank you, Ms. Faith. So before we, we move to um, answering a few questions from, from the audience, I would like all the speakers to I would appreciate your insights on one final aspect. So given the advancements in generative AI technologies, how do you anticipate the integration of these tools, uh, I mean by the generative AI models, uh, with big data analytics to uh, shape the future of insights generation and decision making within the financial sector? So do we see any um, uh, uh, short-term uh, uh, impacts or, or changes with regards to, to, to this? So uh, I can start perhaps with, or I can continue with Ms. Faith, if you can elaborate on this point. And then I will move to Mr. Hamid and then Dr. Morris. Definitely, uh, there are quick short gains that uh, we, we, we do gain, uh, but we're looking more on the long term as well as, um, as an industry and as corporates and on a national uh, level as well at a situation where we want to bring everyone into the financial bracket. We want to move to a situation whereby everyone comes into the bank, everyone becomes bankable. And we are moving to a situation where digital currencies is, is, is the next big thing. And in today's world, uh, what we want to understand is, just give me a second, sorry. One minute. Sorry for that. So yes, uh, when we're looking at the short-term gains and also the long-term gains, what we want is a situation where everyone comes into this financial bracket and we're able to transact, we're able to build a system where it's interoperable, uh, systems can be able to talk to each other, we are able to have integration of different products and services where we come to that one-stop shop at the end of the day. Thank you, Ms. Faith. Uh, Mr. Hamid, any comments on this point? Yeah, for, so from a banking perspective, of course, I mean, uh, using the generative AI with big data to uh, analyze certain information, come up with suggested uh, decisions and algorithms is very important and will be key going forward. I think uh, it's very important to, uh, to keep in mind that we should use such technology always with caution, uh, use it as a support tool and not as the decision-making tool. Uh, simply because of many reasons that we discussed today, uh, that data quality is one issue. The other is the way that the system analyzes the data. And finally, uh, you know, human experiences uh, sometimes cannot be algorithmized. And so basically you always have to make sure that 
this kind of technology is used as a support, uh, not uh, the overarching decision making there. Thank you, Mr. Hamid. Dr. Maurice, over to you. Yes, so I mean, in, just in order to, to corroborate that, so to say, I think, uh, I mean, considering that particularly with generative AI, uh, what our recent study showed is you have like a, an, a potential of roughly 5%, you know, like in a universal bank, roughly 5% on the top line and 15% on efficiency. Yeah. How do you do it? It's not only by use cases, it's um, by embracing an organizational transformation, also democratizing, you know, the leverage of AI within the organization and trying to, so to say, not only to provide for the different uh, infrastructural and analytics components which need to be in place, but also ultimately to, to enhance the data literacy and obviously the willingness of the people or to, to counter check, as, as uh, Mr. Hamed said, right, a, to, to counter check your intuition with data analytics in a way that it's beneficial to people because that will uh, that will ultimately enhance the, the, the leverage you have with the data. Uh, it will enhance the organizational capabilities and it will obviously also reap in the profits or also the cost savings which are relevant for the senior management in order to double down on, on having a data-driven business model. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Morris. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, before we uh, transition into the Q&A session, I would like to extend our heartfelt gratitude to our distinguished speakers, Ms. Faith, uh, Dr. Hamid, uh, Mr. Hamid, and uh, uh, Dr. Maurice, your uh, invaluable insights into the intersection of big data and generative AI, as well as uh, the, the impact of, of these on the financial sector have been enlightening. So now it is time to open the floor for uh, for the questions. So please feel free to share your inquiries in the chat or in in the Q and A um, uh, section. So I can see uh, some questions. So there is one question related to um, the the implementation challenges of big data analytics in Islamic finance. So these includes how institutions align. Analytics, which are AI compliance, integrate legacy systems with advanced tools, manage costs and complexities of big data technologies like AI, and ensure skilled professional professionals in both Islamic finance and uh, data analytics. How is the industry effectively addressing these complex uh, challenges? Could you provide any statistics or data that highlight the success rate of big data analytics implementation in the field of Islamic finance. I think we already answered this question in different uh, uh, different discussion point. But if you if the speakers would like to to add any additional points, please feel free to to do so. So happy to, you know, to uh, point a couple of, of words to that in addition to that. Yeah, I mean, um, as you already uh, mentioned, uh, the implementation, yeah, I really believe needs to be uh, very much tailor-made also for the specific bank and obviously also for the Islamic finance products, which, um, uh, you know, which uh, which uh, the, the bank provides. So uh, as I see the question uh, is, is posed from uh, Mr. al at the... Um, I believe it's I believe it's the Islamic Development Bank, right? So, um, I, I, in in the mindset of a development bank, right? You obviously look may, maybe at other products in comparison to other financial institutions. So, implementation strap will differ a bit. But then, and I I would um, agree with you that we, we pointed out some of the major pitfalls in terms of like you know the data literacy, the data governance, also to have like a data strategy. If you really go like top down in terms of data strategy, data governance, data quality management, data architecture. So this is like you can think of it a bit as a pyramid, yeah. And if you go through these aspects and you have that fixed and you have like a, a good data literacy within the organization, then it should work. But with a particular um, Stint, so to say that for Islamic finance, obviously, you know, you cannot take the data governance, which is established at, I don't know, like Deutsche Bank or something like this, because they, for instance, um, you know, you don't, they don't need data filters for halal and haram, for instance, but they just do essentially whatever it takes, uh, or maybe they have like, you know, some, some incentivization by the regulator not to 
do too many brown industries, more like greenwashing or something like this, but that, that's essentially. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. Ms. Faith, uh, Mr. Hamid, you would like to add on this point? Uh, in terms of statistics, there are available data sources which are available. For example, I'll give the GSMI, uh, which is in the mobile financial services sector. Uh, they do have information which is easily accessible. And if you need, as uh, mentioned uh, by Dr. Morris, if you need uh, specialized information, tailored information, then there's also other means that you can be able to, to access that when you reach out to the respective um, respective organizations as well, yes. Thank you. Sir Hamid? Well, I concur with my colleagues uh, on that. I mean, it's a, it's a challenge to always implement new systems when we talked about the legacy system point, for example. The older that your infrastructure is, the more difficult it is to uh, upgrade it into, you know, to be able to use sort of things like generative AI. So it becomes challenging the older the bank is. And we have an example here in Bahrain uh, with the new digital banks that opened up recently. The later that you open, the better you are in terms of infrastructure and customer service because you're set up at a time where technology has improved. If you were the market leader uh, 10 years ago in onboarding and all that, you had to invest a lot more to keep up on the pace with the way the technology is going on. Thank you. We have another question on the, the regulation aspect. So how are regulators adapting to the integration of big data analytics into the in the, the financial sector with the, with the focus on the Islamic finance and what regulatory consideration should the institutions keep in mind? So if, if I may just uh, reflect on that, I mean, I part, partly answered it during during my sections. Um, the main, the main, the most important part of the regulation is data privacy and the ethical use of this data, and that's what central bank uh, Bahrain as well and other central banks in the world focus on. The idea there is that you have uh, customer sensitive data. There's two kinds of data: personal sensitive data, and then there's uh, norm public publicly available data. But when banks can, when banks have access to all of your spendings, uh, they know where you've been. Uh, they can identify uh, what you like to spend on, what you don't. The use of that data needs to be in a very ethical format. Uh, and with obviously always with the customer's consent that can be revocable as well at any time. So that's what this is a, is a key uh, aspect of managing uh, any, 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 not just a bank, any company that has access to sort of sensitive data has to really keep that in mind always. And maybe to, 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 to add to that, right? I mean, particularly if you, if you look through it uh, in the European lens, you, you all know that there is, uh, at least in the making, this EU AI Act, which, which tries to, so to say, like unify um, AI regulations of, of European states and in, in, the, in the Middle East. Um, as you as you just you know um, uh, outlined, Mr. Mr. Hamed, right? It's 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 not you yeah, unified yet, right? But I mean, in Saudi Arabia, you have like the, the intellectual property laws, you have the data and I authority strategy. You know, there's thinking going on. For instance, there are other initiatives in the United Arab Emirates. I'm not precisely sure about uh, behind to be to be very fair with you, but. Um, I think also if you look to the US and also to China, it's quite clear that the regulatory framework around leveraging uh, particularly generative AI will tighten beyond, you know, the, 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 the leverage of uh, customer data, as you just pointed it out, right, in terms of not doing it without the consent and obviously also being able to, you know, delete it at any time if they revoke their consent, but also in terms of what happens if you use generative AI technologies um, to uh, essentially uh, generate synthetic training data, for instance, for your credit risk models or something like this. Yeah, and based on that, um, there are particularly in, in, in Europe, there are already you know considerations around regulations whether you're actually allowed to do that or not, because these uh, these training data could essentially be either taken from another source of intellectual property or they could be somehow flawed, and and that's why uh, the regulator reverts back to more classical approaches. To, uh, to essentially, you know, like generate these training data for the internal 
credit risk scoring methods of, of the banks. Yeah, and I'm I'm quite sure that this 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 uh, you know um, regulatory theme will will expand uh, itself beyond uh, or on the on the whole globe. And what can you actually for what can you actually uh, like use um, uh, Gen AI and for what not? Particularly also in the terms of explainability, and that's obviously also rationale within the Middle East. Yeah, explainability of the models. If you cannot really explain why a model suggested something particularly, you are, you are also not allowed to use it. Yeah, and uh, but but uh, as as you already pointed out very correctly, it's still very much evolving, and it will for the next, I, I presume, one or two years, definitely. Sven, do you have any points to add on this? No, I concur with my colleagues. Thank you. Um, I think we have another another question on the emerging trends. Um, well, two last questions, and then we, we will uh, close the, the webinar. So um, we talked about uh, generative AI, but is there any emerging trends uh, that you, you foresee in the integration of big data analytics within the Islamic finance in the coming years? Well, maybe, uh, you know, I think the question points at, at something uh, beyond big data, uh, beyond uh, generative AI, or is it? Yeah. yeah. No, beyond generative AI. Well, I mean, for sure, uh, the, you know, the, like the potential of generative AI is, is uh, the, the way it obviously works is right. Is, 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 is a, like a very smart comparison yeah, of, uh, of uh, new questions and old questions, which already have been posed. And there's obviously a certain limitation, right? In, in terms of the technological way, it is just, it's working. It's not thinking, right? It's just like, it's comparing stuff which has been previously there, there before. And what you obviously could think about while there are, are already analysis tools built in and tools like ChatGPT and something like this to have like a, you know, like a broader adoption of, of really, um, so to say, like thinking um, mechanisms, yeah, within, uh, with, with, within this technology. And the, the second thing, so this, this might be the one, you know, pillar. The other pillar, uh, what might be interesting is also, um, uh, what, what should be embraced within the Islamic financing realm more broadly is what we call ecosystem sensing. And ecosystem sensing is, um, I, you know, we, we in Europe, uh, what we really felt was during the pandemic, a bank, for instance, did not only have to look at its clients within the portfolio, but it also need, started to need to look at the value chain of the clients in the portfolio. So for instance, um, imagine you have like an industrial manufacturer in your portfolio, you give a loan to them or something like this. Yeah. And, and the, the, the issue is that um, they could produce, there's also demand for the product they produce, but the ship, which essentially like carries all the parts in order for them to produce is stuck in the, in the, in the Suez channel, so to say. I mean, we, we all witnessed this last year, but in, so, so to have like, so to say like a value chain enhancing, um, uh, yeah, uh, terminology and also sensing, as I said, ecosystem sensing, which not only focuses on your client, but also on the, uh, on the relation of clients to clients and also clients to suppliers, uh, which you can track with specific, you know, quantitative indicators, something which we in our publications refer to as high frequency indicators because it, it's very volatile, right? Like satellite data and so on and so forth. So this is something which I think will also be more and more relevant within the, 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 the region of, of Islamic finance. And, uh, and at least to our knowledge, uh, certain banks have already also started to implement it. Sure. Thank you. Um, Mr. Hamid or Ms. Faith, do you want to add any points on this? Otherwise, I can move to another question. Okay, then. So um, there is one question. How does big data analytics enhance Sharia compliance in Islamic finance institutions? And how can big data optimize risk management in Islamic finance practices? So, Mr. Hamid or Dr. Morris. Yeah. Yes, uh, I mean, when, when we look at big data with Sharia compliance, uh, big data analytics can be used uh, to analyze either 
customer data or internal bank data or volumes and um, operational practices as well. So when we look at Sharia compliance, uh, the use of AI with sort of big data, uh, you can use these sort of outcomes to perform internal assessments and operations on the measures by which your institution is compliant with Sharia principles. Uh, in addition to this, when we look at Islamic financial institutions like Islamic investment institutions, uh, when they are assessing uh, which uh, which uh, private equity transactions to enter into or which investments to go into, the use of uh, generative AI or, or AI, I mean the analytics AI with uh, uh, big data, can help identify whether the target companies, what extent and what metric are they compliant with Sharia, with Islamic principles. Uh, when it comes to risk management. Uh, it, it operates in the same principle, whether it's an Islamic institution or not. Uh, the other underlying assessment is credit risk, for example, or market or operational risk. And uh, the use of that uh, uh, big data analytics that you have in your current portfolio and harnessing on data that is available publicly for the competitive market can give you an indication of how risk, what is the risk appetite of your competitors and how risk averse they are and how, how, how uh, how risky uh, their deals are. And so that also gives you an indication of where your market's going to. Thank you, Mr. Ali. And, and maybe That's just to, 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 add to, to add to that very briefly, uh, in, the, in the realm of, of risk, I, I fully agree. Um, and, and, but also in the terms of like Islamic finance sense, I, one of the ideas which you might come up with is obviously it provides you with like more, I mean, more data means most of the time more accurate, no? And, and, and you can also particularly decide um, in, in terms of like the, the, uh, the prohibition of gara, you know, like trade, so to say, or derivatives and stuff like this, which kind of like which, which products you might offer and which products you might not offer in order to, you know, be within the, the 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 given the given precincts, right? And that might that might be actually something which will also be further facilitated by techniques from machine learning or, um, you know, like uh, uh, artificial intelligence methodologies, anyways. Thank you, Dr. Morris. And uh, we will finish with one last question. Um, regarding the average time, time frame for implementing a moderate scale big data analytics uh, project in the Islamic finance sector and what factors could influence this timeline? So I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to start, but I think that Mr. Hamed maybe had, has a, a better view on that because you've done it yourself at your institution. I can just provide like the outside in view. Um, it, and it really depends on the uh, it really depends on the on the on, on, on your status quo, right? What do you have in the moment? Because it can be, I mean, it, it needs a certain time frame for sure, but it, it depends on uh, where, where is your starting point, right? Also in terms of particularly big data analytics and also the required infrastructure that you need to 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 loop. Are you do you have you already moved? moved into the cloud or are you still so to say very much on premise uh, do you plan to move into a, a cloud environment right because it will somehow like facilitate um, the transitioning particularly if you are you know if you are not uh, if, you, if you don't plan uh, if you don't plan to build anything you know on site so to say because it can be can be quite expensive but um, if we talk about quick wins yeah you may be I mean, obviously you have a conceptualization phase and you have an implementation phase, but I would be very much surprised if this, even in a modest, you know, scale, we, we did this for a player in, in German, uh, sorry, in, in, in Europe and uh, with, 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 the, with the banking as a service solution. So they didn't develop everything from scratch, but they just, you know, like they picked uh, vendors like Mambu and, and Chino and something like this and just put their architecture together. And this was also like a, a, a one year endeavor, but uh, please, you know, like uh, correct me and enhance, enhance Mr. Um, Hamid. Yeah. Yes, I think doctor, I think you've uh, articulated it very well. I think the begin, the starting point is before we talk about how long it takes, we have to first make sure that our data sets are correct. So the first objective within the, the, the exercise or the journey of going into big data analytics is, is data cleansing at your level. And that can take as long as it takes, depending on the quality of your data, how old your institution is, 
the, the older that the institution is, maybe there was a few core banking migrations and upgrades that resulted in certain data not being very, uh, very, very good quality. So it might take you longer to fix that. But if we talk about then uh, just developing a certain basic or moderate AI analytics tool, then of course you, you can say one year, you can say one and a half years. Uh, but my, 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 my real response to this would be is there is no time frame because there is no end. There's no end to this. Uh, you're, you, you will always continue developing and updating and technology will continue changing day in, day out. Uh, this is not a project that you can start and close. Uh, maybe milestones can be done. So you can have quick wins, as you mentioned. You can have certain other milestones there. But if we talk about the journey of going into the next phase of big data analytics, it's, I don't think it's, an, it's, it's a never ending cycle because technology will continue developing while you develop your own applications on your systems. Uh, but generally, if you want to start and if you have a good data set, you'll give yourself at least 12 months to see something at least on ground. And Thank maybe you. I can just add yeah. on as well to that to sure. say it also depends on the size of the organization and uh, how much work you have done. So it's very important to understand where are we today, what's our status quo, and based on which uh, you can then be able to uh, move forward. Thank you, Ms. Faith. Ladies and gentlemen, we have now come to the end of our webinar. We would like to thank all the speakers that have joined us today for the valuable insights shared and the fruitful discussion that covered various aspects of this topic. We would like to thank the audience and participants for their attention and for the acts of participa participation. Please visit Sibafi website and follow us on social media to be updated on Sibafi activities and initiatives. We thank you again and we look forward to seeing you in our future events. Thank you and have a very good day ahead. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.